Well, uh, please, uh, let's take a moment to uh, thank uh, Raul and Virginia uh, and uh, Adam again for their wonderful <laughs> presentation. So I know that we're collecting uh, the three by five cards now again, and you can, I mean, they'll come to me in a moment and I'll certainly ask the questions uh, that, are, that are on them. And we also envision this as free flowing as well, so you can certainly stand up and, 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 and ask a question uh, for any of them individually or, or collectively. But since I had this microphone on my tie here, uh, <laughs> I get to ask the first question. Um, and it struck me hearing um, the, the three of you individually, I was curious, one, just as a, a general factoid, were you aware of each other's work prior to this? No. Okay. So we've, done, we've accomplished something mighty here already. <laughs> yeah, right. So that leads me to another question then. In hearing one another then, was there any elements of each other's work that you saw something in, in common? I think uh, for me it's, uh, am I on? You're on? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, what, what I was really moved by is the larger question of, not on my <laughs> I think the, the larger question that's moving our, our, that I saw moving our work is the sense of wanting to create social change, right? mm. this, uh, of making the world a better place, uh, as cheesy as that might sound, but in very specific practical ways by celebrating the richness of the spe specificity of our, the, the people or the objects that we study, but with that vision of wanting to, to create a more just world. Mm. Virginia? Yeah, well, I think also there's this concept that we use all the time at the YWCA, um, which was meeting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. And the idea of meeting people, I think that sort of links the three of us as well, is this idea of um, building from people's real experiences, their everyday experiences, um, into mm -hmm. sort of the bigger questions seems to be something that, um, that links us as well. Yeah, and, and to extend that, just thinking beyond assumptions, I mean, certain assumptions of what it means to be a Latino, certain assumptions about the digital divide, certain assumptions about what hip hop culture is. I mean, these are, these, are, these are all things that I think the best academic work challenges. The best academic work, my, my old mentor said, begins with a question. Your book begins with some sort of mystery that you want to solve. And mm. I, I think that that I could hear animating uh, the, the two wonderful talks that that Raul and, and Virginia gave. I, I hear implied too in, in all of, of your works that, I'll step out on, on a limb here, but we're all family at this point, so we can do that, <laughs> and this is a safe place. Uh, but I almost got the sense that you feel that there's something collectively missing in our, our, in our consciousness about how we're talking about uh, these issues. Can, have you been able to crystallize what that is that's, that's missing through the lens of, of each of your individual works? So you're starting with the easy questions, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it's people know nothing about Latinos, I think. Very little. Mm. I, think, um, I think most people think about it as, a, as a, the, the, the way it's described, has been described in, the, in journalism since the 60s. And in the 60s, 70s, during the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, you know, it was a sleeping minority, right? They're um, awakening. Yeah. Um, and now it's like the demographics, like, oh, they're now the largest minority. So it's always a sense of they're coming, they're arriving, but they're never quite here. <laughs> in a threatening way? Yeah. Thre well, definitely a threatening way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's seen, definitely seen as threatening. Um, but, but my impetus is not to do contemporary sociology, but to say, yeah, well, they were there back then also, right, uh -huh. in the 19th century. And for me, it's back, they were there back then, but also it's the writing, right, that, that when writing becomes literature, that sense of presence of being and belonging and, and writing down their dreams and aspirations. Like, mm -hmm. I want to bring those voices from the past back to life. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's definitely what I sense that's missing. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think, Raul, you struck on something when you were talking about the four things you tell your students that literature can do that, that inspired me as well. And, and I'm also a professor of English, even though I tend to write about music and popular culture more than anything else. But my, my grassroots goes back to literature. And Ralph Ellison, author of Invisible Man, a classic novel of the, the 1950s, one of the great African-American novels of the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, 
he had a, a wonderful way of, of expressing the importance of literature that I think can, can be broadened out into, into some of the discussions we're having today, which is that literature provides a place to imagine alternative realities. He said that he imagined his novel as, as a raft of hope. It's a raft of hope. And I think that the challenge uh, in, in corporate America is to create similar vehicles, whether it's, it may not be the vessel of a novel, but a, a place to think about uh, alternative ways of negotiating the difficult course that, that lies before us. What will that look like? What, what are ways of, of kind of articulating that in very concrete senses in the day in, day out realities of, of, of your workplaces that, that can help lead us uh, in, this, in the limited sense of, of a particular corporation, but also in the broader sense of this country toward a, a way of understanding this multiracial American reality that we're all living in. So, I mean, I, I think that that's a big, big thing that's missing, and, mm -hmm. and literature has a way of, of doing it, but I also think that it's con contingent upon the, the places where people are already mixing uh, to think about these things. And one of the things that um we sort of discovered in doing this participatory work at the Y is how few places there are for people to actually talk about um, from and across their differences. Um, and that you can build those structures. It is possible, but it t it, you need to be really, really thoughtful about it. You need to pay a lot of attention to the process. You need to pay a lot of attention to meeting people where they're at. Um, and you need to pay a lot of attention to creating um, the kind of respect that can um, get people to places where they can speak their truths and survive it, right? Okay. Um, so well, I think one of the big places, and Raul pointed to this in um, his comments, one of the big places that we are very bad about speaking our truths in the United States is around class. Um, though we don't um, personalize our class identities in the way they do in other countries, we certainly have. Um, a very well-established hierarchical class system in this country. And frankly, I think, I'd say in the last just six months to a year, all of a sudden that conversation has gotten started yeah. with you or without you, right? Occupy is having that conversation <laughs> right now. Right. Um, and I think one of the reasons that people can't recognize Occupy as like a social movement with clear agendas and goals is because we don't actually have that language of talking about class, right? They're talking about class, we, but many people can't hear them, right? Um, and that, that thing has legs. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, I guarantee that today. Um, I live in a very cold place. I live in um, upstate New York. It's not as cold as Buffalo, but it's cold in Albany. And they've committed to stay there through the end of February, right? Like, so they've, they've, they've occupied um, the state capitol and plan to stay there till the end of February. And like, that's, um, that's a commitment. And that's something that, that really bears listening to, I think, and really is begging us to have this question about um, uh, across different experiences. And you know it's mainstream when the cover of Time Magazine this week is a, a broken ladder. You know, this mm. idea of going up the ladder of class. And, and mm. you, you know it's, it's now entering the, the, the mainstream discourse. So. Mm. I think, I think you're exactly right. Like We need to figure out ways of, of having these conversations as well. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to um, and, uh, ask a few questions uh, that, that were here, some of them general, some of them uh, specific. Uh, this one's for Raul. Uh, I smiled when I read it. How would you recommend introducing cultural nuances of Latinos to non-academic audiences. I think in corporate America, oftentimes we, we talk about democracy, demography because of Virginia's point, we don't have any framework for talking about the, the wonderful nuances and beauty of the Latino uh, culture in, in corporate settings because we want things very quickly, distilled, and, and the likes. So any suggestions as, as, as to how we can be better? I mean, again, as I said before, I know nothing about the corporate world, so what you know. You will I, by the time you're done here. Right? Yeah. So, so you know, like, we're going to change that. Now. So you say it's, you, know, you have like pithy kind of statements about demography or diversity. I don't know what those really are that you mm. are sharing and circulating. But I think for me, my sense, not, to, and I'm here, I'm, I'm getting, uh, uh, taking my cues from my students and what they know and don't know, right? And I know mm. there's a major disconnect between, I mean, in terms of age of, from them and the corporate world, people who work in the corporate world. But for me, I think it's a sense of understanding how race operates. The way we think about race and, and demography, my sense is when we see numbers in the census, is that these are fixed static categories and people fit into them. 
Um, and uh, that's the way it is, and that's the way it always has been. Mm -hmm. But for me, if I insist on this, how it's historical process, how it's changed over time, how in the 19th century, the Irish were definitely not seen as white. They, there were race, racial, mm -hmm. uh, uh, violent, racial violence in the 19th century against, directed against uh, the Irish. Um, and so to understand the nuances in race and how it fluctuates over time, and therefore if it fluctuates over time, then that means that we can also undo it. But without, without undoing the richness of that sense of diversity, right? I think that's the other mm. kind of fear perhaps that some people might express. If you say it doesn't really exist, then are you saying that my culture is not really worthy of being celebrated and mm. uh, put forward as something that needs to be protected? Right, their, their, their own kind of cultural production or thinking about those communities and um, what affirmative action or different ways of trying to include people. So for me, the way I think about it is to understand that Latinos um, have this, come from this very different kind of racialized background, um, have a very different kind of vocab a different vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So Latinos can be white, they can be black, they can be Native American, mestizo. I think the socioeconomic context there is that, for the most part, the large numbers of Latinos who come to the US tend to be from more working class, impoverished backgrounds from Latin America. Right? They're leaving those countries in large part because of uh, economic opportunities, which means then also that the phenotype and the class stratification in Latin America, then you, you're not seeing the blonde and blue eyes, blue eyed Latinos from Latin America immigrating to the US to work in the fields. Right, they're not, mm. that, that's not what right, I have. Right, so you have right. just very different kind of right. systems, racial systems uh, 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 in operation now. Great. So how do you distill that? Uh, <laughs> that, I mean, that was five minutes, uh, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the forward to your next book. <laughs> yeah. uh, this one's for Adam, um, and this is, uh, this too reflects a lot of conversations that we, we often have at, at conferences. Uh, how do you make the hip hop generation less scary uh, to corporate America? Any recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, part of it is to understand that the hip hop generation is already among, amongst you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I had this realization, uh, well, I, I re-had this realization, let's put it that way. Uh, about a month ago, I got interviewed by the Washington Times. There was a young Marine who had been kind of making a name for himself in the underground hip hop scene. And uh, they sent me some clips of this kid performing. And he's, he's white, he's from the Midwest. And he'd be in these hip hop battle contexts, both literally on a battlefield, <laughs> almost you know, in Afghanistan, with a group of servicemen who are also members of the hip hop generation, also active participants in creating hip hop culture. And he'd be in these, these battles of ciphers, exchanging lyrics. But then he'd be on the home front in his civilian uniform, you know, outfit in his you know, baggy jeans or whatever <laughs> the hip hop you know, affect is. And he'd be in these other settings that to me were even scarier, <laughs> like basement, uh, you know, sweaty looking basement places with a bunch of 20 year old men. Uh, looking menacing, mm -hmm. and he'd go down there and he'd, he'd do his thing, the only white kid in the room. Uh, yeah. And so th I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an awakening, I think, to, to understand that hip hop is now a global culture, that it looks, it doesn't look like any one thing, even though the, the image that the, pop, the kind of mainstream hip hop mm -hmm. media puts out is, is that of a Jay-Z, Kanye West, Kid Cudi, whomever else. But what hip hop really looks like is, is everything is all of us. And so I, I think that, that would be the key insight is, is just to, to, to understand just how diffused it is and how many shapes it takes, particularly given the international context. And this is maybe where it, it gets to the external aspect of your job. I and mean, a lot of what we've been talking about is more about what you do within the workplace, but also thinking about how to reach out to new communities, new, new possibilities, new places to open McDonald's, you know. <laughs> and hip hop is a way to do that because, because there are already homegrown versions of the music wherever, you know, place on the earth, probably even Antarctica. I know that a friend of mine, DJ Spooky, took a journey down to Antarctica <laughs> about uh, six months ago. So, I mean, hip hop is everywhere and it, it, it provides a kind of amazing fusion of the close at hand and the inherited. It provides a fusion of, of what America is 
at its best and sometimes at its worst in what these, these, these new uh, places and spaces are in their organic sensibility. So it's, uh, I would emph emphasize just again that hip hop is there in, in plain sight around you and that hip hop also is a transformative process that can be filled with any number of meanings depending on the context and the culture. Hmm. Virginia, um, I, but certainly I'll, I'll begin with you, but I, I, I actually appreciate Raul and Adams. Uh, uh, we'd appreciate your perspectives on this question as well. How do you communicate the importance, the continued importance, of discussing diversity and inclusion despite diversity fatigue? Hmm. Well, I was actually just having this conversation um, yesterday after I, I did my talk um, at the uh, Harold Washington Library. Um, and again, I hate to sort of beat the horse of Occupy, but I think it's actually opened up a moment um, for us to have a lot of conversations that we haven't been willing or able to have um, in, um, in, in the last few years. Um, The way that I um, continue to engage this kind of work, um, which is a little unusual for uh, an academic, right? Like we're, we're a wildly sort of cosmopolitan lot. We move around. The, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the supposition in academia is if like your career is going to go anywhere, you have to like up and leave every five years and sort of build this sort of career ladder. Um, I've actually uh, stayed very much in one place um, for, for kind of a long time now, which is unusual for, um, for, for my tribe. Um, and one of the things that's been really useful about that is that um, it's created a kind of accountability to people um, on the ground who are encountering problems firsthand. Um, that is very literal in some ways, right? The women who I talk about in this book know where I live. They come and knock on my door. If I mess up, they let me know. Um, so they're like, I saw something on the internet about me, and you got it wrong. And so I got to write something else that says, like, I got it wrong again, and here's what happened. <laughs> um, and so. Uh, you know, I don't think that's the right approach for everybody, but I think that there's a lesson in there about stimulating accountability to our communities um, and responding to the kinds of things that people are facing in their everyday lives. Um, for me, that has been like stay in one place. For you, it might be something else, right? But that focus on accountability, I think, has kept my work relevant in a way um, and has kept me from sort of, I hope, kept me from falling into the sort of auto-poetic problems of the academy, which is we just talk to ourselves, and we talk to ourselves, and we talk to ourselves, and we get more and more obscure, and more and more are cut off from you know, um, everyday, real people's everyday problems. Um, I think finding mechanisms to stimulate that accountability, whether that's to your customers, or to your shareholders, or to the people in your community, or to your family, mm -hmm. or um, whatever that means, um, finding ways to stimulate that accountability actually creates um, really interesting, innovative stuff that wouldn't happen otherwise. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I think for, for uh, the history of diversity and inclusion in a lot of corporate environments is accountability. It's, it's been mm -hmm. arguably the biggest challenge, yeah. um, particularly in, in times where we generally say, when you ask a lot of you know, senior leaders, what do you think about diversity and inclusion? They go, well, I'm all for it. <laughs> you know, and, and they gave that same answer. Somebody said, well, what do you think about opening up a new office? Well, I'm all for it. You know? uh, but there's a sense that when you leave the room, uh, be, beyond the obligatory head nod, you don't, you're not going to get much more in the way of, of duration than that. There's, there's just a general struggle, I, I, I think, that, that we have. I mean, accountability is not easy, you know? Um, it's, I don't want to necessarily go out for a cup of coffee and run into three people I wrote this book with who like, want to tell me all about what's going on in their lives now. Like, I just want mm. a coffee and a newspaper, and I want to go home. Um, but that's... that's you know, how do we um, create structures that keep us honest, um, that keep us grounded in um, um, people's real everyday problems, is, mm. and survive it again, yeah. um, is, is, is part of the puzzle. Here. So is, is the primary issue of how do we keep our corporation diverse? How do we make it more diverse? Is that the issue? I think it's part of it, but let me <laughs> open it up to the, to the floor and uh, ask some of you to, to chime in. Um, to Raul's question. Or is it about your market, like yeah. wanting to diversify your market? I'd offer a perspective, and that is 
is two things. One is to recognize that our environments are much more diverse than we can even imagine. Secondly, once you recognize it, and I'm going to use a corporate term, how do you capitalize on it? Uh, and that's not in a negative sense meant to, to exploit, but it's changing. The workforce, our customers are changing. I mean, how do we integrate hip hop? I mean, there's a value there, a value proposition, and how do you integrate? I don't know, that's kind of one perspective. And we don't even know all of the dimensions of diversity that are about to impact us. I just want to add to what Haven said. I think it's really about inclusion um, because I think that you know, a lot of companies have, they can celebrate diversity, but I don't think they are really as inclusive as they can and should be. And so I think that there are people that have not achieved certain levels that they can achieve. So I think inclusion is really important. I mean, my experience is, in, again, in the university structure. I was educated in California in my doctoral degree. And um, the reason, primary reason why I came to Chicago, the University of Chicago, is that California, the universities have a very long history of having ethnic studies. There's African American studies, Latino studies, very long histories, there are decades. Chicago does not, I think maybe it's 10, 15 years, I think, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. But the difference there is that in California, when I interviewed for jobs there, I was seen as you will be the Latino person and you go off and do what you do, right? Mm -hmm. The questions that I was asking, people who worked in Renaissance literature were not interested in, right? But they were like, oh, you do that, I know nothing about it. At Chicago, people who worked in Victorian lit, like, wow, this is a really fascinating question. When does writing become literature? Like, let's talk about mm -hmm. that. And so there, there was a sense definitely of valuing my research interest. But on the other hand, you don't have the, the, the sense of communities there that you have in California that are embedded and which you can go to for finding allies, right? So there's that sense then also that similar of like valuing that sense of inclusion at the level, not just of the body, but the ideas, right? The, how they can really transform the question of like, well, what is literature? And there was an important element in the initial question you asked about fatigue, diversity fatigue mm -hmm. and, and you know, I would say just don't be afraid of fatigue. <laughs> you, know, you don't think Martin Luther King got tired? <laughs> you know, and, and there's, there's a fatigue both of, of you as someone advocating for uh, a different kind of corporate environment and, and a fatigue upon the listeners, whether it be in, in, in management or even below the, you know, the affinity groups and the different sorts of organizations where, where you know, we're having these same conversations and we'll pay lip service, but there isn't necessarily buy-in. And, and that's when I think coming up with alternative means of, of approaching it. Even a conversation like this is a beginning because it's, it's shaking up uh, some of the discourse and hearing other ways of, of thinking, other ways of talking about ideas that you're already talking about. That alone uh, might be a way of, of, of re-inspiring. I mean, that's, that's a, the great thing that you know, Jay-Z in his recent book, Decoded, said that what hip hop does that, that's so uh, dynamic that makes it such a, a powerful force across all sorts of differences is that it takes one word and gives it 12 meanings. And I think there's, mm -hmm. there's something to be said for that of reinvention through, through rhetoric alone, through language alone. And, it, and there's some, some power in the word. Uh, and so, so be inspired by that. Steve. Yeah, to me, as I listen to you talk and I think about the, the world we're in and this whole inter, you know, the, the whole fatigue conversation, to me, it's a lot more about the intergenerational aspect of what we do. And so, you know, the, if you think of the power structures traditionally of corporations today, right, we're, we're mostly boomers, okay, and yet the emerging workforce, the folks that we are all bringing the organization, the Xers and, and, and millennials, you know, my three kids, I got a 26 year old, a 24 year old, a 19 year old. They're the hip hop generation. Yeah. That's what they relate to. They don't even understand why my job as a chief diversity officer exists. Yeah. They cannot understand why there has to be a job like mine. And yet the leadership would always want to talk in very traditional terms. And so I think as I think about the question that Steve posed and some of what you're talking today about, it's this intergenerational opportunity, I'll call yeah, it. Yeah. Um, because I think we have to talk, and, and that's what I've been writing notes on this morning, I think we have to think of and talk in very, very different ways than the traditional structures want us to do it. So that's what's intriguing here today. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I just wanted to add to that because the word that I uh, wrote down is, as I was listening to, to you was, was the, uh, the generational differences. 
and I, I am an example of the four generations in the workforce. Uh, I was recently working in a, in a public authority where my grandson was hired as an engineer. Hmm. And you can imagine when I'd see my grandson in the elevator, he would call me <laughs> Nana. And so it was, it was just kind of like, okay, and these other people are looking at me as this chief diversity officer. <laughs> and he's calling me Nana, and I'm hugging him, and he's as tall as, you know, he's about six feet tall. And he doesn't look like me at all. And, you know, when listening to you, Raul, and, and thinking about my, my uh, you know, my Latinoism is that my grandchildren, you know, they don't really identify with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, their last name is uh, Cavazos, because my two sons are, you know, um, Cavazos, and uh, my grandson, he's Cavazos, but, but he doesn't look at all like his, uh, Hispanic. You know, he's, he's, his mother is, is Anglo, and he, you know, even though he loves Mexican food and he loves everything Mexican culture, but he's just not, you know, he's totally like assimilated. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about that multiculturalism now that, that we're looking at. But all three of you just gave excellent, excellent examples of what's going on in, in this whole area of diversity because I've been in this for more than 25, 30 years, more than I care to admit. <laughs> but um, everything that you said is, is, is so relevant and so important. I don't really understand the hip hop generation. And in my culture, you know, the words and the things that are said there sometimes are rude and crude. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's kind of, I don't, I don't get it. And I was thinking, what's going to happen to them when they're grandparents? Are they going to be that hip hop generation or is it going to be a total change? And that's what I'm looking at. What's the future for all of this? Because all of it touches on very relevant topics. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love your point of the, the gener intergenerational, both of the points. Is, uh, and you know, I want to answer the hip hop generation part though, because that, that, think back on rock and roll. Think about Elvis moving, swiveling his hips, <laughs> and how, what a revolution that was, and what what the parents of that generation were saying about the youth of that moment. Uh, I think the thing that we learn is that uh, people of the hip hop generation, and broadly figured, uh, and it doesn't mean you even have to listen to hip hop, but just are of this particular moment, are adept at multi-linguistic feats of, of code switching, as the sociologists say, of, of knowing that you're not going to talk in a corporate boardroom the same way that you talk to your boys, the same way that you talk to your mother, the same way that you move among that. And, and there's a fluidity that's, that's, I think, always been, particularly in, in minority cultures where there's a ne necessary negotiation of those terms. Uh, but I think it's even been highlighted uh, to a greater extent through, through this moment with hip hop, which, which can move through all of these different zones and, and still keep its integrity. Okay. I'm sorry, here and then yeah. I'll go back there. I just think the one, the, the one message that I've picked up from this whole day is the fact of having that, those type of courageous conversations and creating a safe space to really have that. Because to your point, uh, in corporate America, those uh, leaders that are mostly at the top are from that boomer gener generation. And those that are coming in, it, it's, it's a different generation, so there's a total disconnect in what we value, what's important, how we operate, how we even transfer information. But I think what's important to understand is that those leaders that are at the top, they don't know everything <laughs> that there is to know. <laughs> and they don't sometimes want to admit it. Mm -hmm. They don't get it. But it doesn't mean that they're wrong, they just don't get it. So the opportunity that we have as leaders, as diversity leaders, is creating that safe space where they can have that conversation yeah. <clears throat> and get it. Yeah. And, be, and be comfortable in saying, I still don't understand, but it's OK. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I still don't understand, yeah. but it's OK. Yeah. So, so if I could just respond to that really quickly. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so one of the things we talk about, I talk about in the, I say we, um, we, <laughs> we worked on this book for a long time. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book though is um, this idea of cognitive justice, which is actually from um, um, an Indian American um, critic of science and technology named Shiv Viswanathan. And the idea there is, um, you know, one, we're all experts in our own lives. So that, that guy up there, he's an expert in his own life and that's great and fine and totally valid knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, though it may be different and it may even be an incommensurable knowledge with knowledge from other parts of the organization, right? And so then the struggle, um, the puzzle, the challenge is how do you create structures that allow exchange of those different knowledges, 
right? In ways that exactly as you say, don't demean anyone's knowledge, but recognize that we all have expertise in our own experience, but that value knowledge that is traditionally seen as um, marginalized, fringy, um, not valued, mm -hmm. not um, authoritative, right? So. I think it's to your point, how do we keep it real? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If I could, and I should have done this as uh, before, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your name. Uh, as I, I'm Sheila, and uh, I'm from Miami. And I just wanted to go back and talk a little bit and tell Raul why what he said was so important to where I live and work. And that's because of that, the, the community down there and um, how it really struck home. And I want to dig a little bit deeper uh, when you talked about how it's like not about race as much as it is about the people, and I know that's a loose, uh, you know, term in, 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 as to what you said, and even how uh, when you put a layer on top of it, most of uh, our executive team are Brazilian, so we got another whole kind of economy that's, mm -hmm. that, that's taking place. So when you said, I don't know how this relates to corporate America, you struck home with me. So I just wanted to, <laughs> to go back and say um, that was very important. Um, the things that you said and how I need to start to, to look at things uh, a lot differently in dealing with that um, dichotomy that's inside the four walls of where I work. I mean, I, I was just thinking of other examples of how I could translate what I know to corporate world, and I thought, why didn't I think about one essay that I, I published as a grad student on Selena? I don't know how many of you knew Selena. She was a Tex-Mex singer who was murdered um, in 95, 96. Um, and I was fascinated with the question of why do people, why do Latinos respond so overwhelmingly, like mm -hmm. emotionally to her death? And what I was fascinated in, in, public, in writing this essay is how corporations actually came in and helped produce her. Right before, before, so I mean, Selena started off as a very regional Tejana um, singer performer, mm -hmm. but it's not until EMI Latin Records came in and picked her up and marketed her as not just Tejano but also Norteño music, northern Mexico, but then also started playing more cumbias. That that whole genre of Tejano music of cumbias became played on radios, and it actually helped foster that community, sense of Latino communities. It also helped produce um, J Lo. Right, because she right. Her, she was a, with that movie. She was a, for the highest paid Latina actress up until then. So corporations definitely have a role in not just promoting cultures, but mm -hmm. like creating these very strong mm -hmm. senses of community that can be local. But then also, Selena spoke to people in Colombia as well. Right. So I mean, that's just one other. I mean, I know that's entertainment uh, entertainment industry, right. but definitely corporations have a, a place in being able to foster those communities. And I think it makes sense when they do it organically, right? Selena was already from that community. She had mm -hmm. roots there, and they were able to foster and give, gave her the skills to be able to do that there, but then also to branch out other places. Yeah. And, and hip hop is a story of that same thing writ large, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, corporate entities disseminating it, whether it's, it is, you know, I'm loving it with my McDonald's or whatever, maybe the different advertising campaigns, the different different sloganing that, that helped uh, introduce hip hop to a broad new global audience. And, and so I, I think that we can see, yeah, that, that corporations also have the potential to be creators of culture. And you know, often it's seen as almost like this parasitic thing, but I, I don't think it necessarily has to be that there's, there's a powerful way, particularly with the minority cultures that we've seen uh, things emerge into the, the forefront that otherwise would have been tamped down, that otherwise would have remain just regional and kind of, kind of splintered. Mm -hmm. A couple more. Yeah, I, uh, just a, a couple of thoughts. I, I was intrigued uh, early on by Adam's comment about um, you know, the, uh, in, the, I think he used the term infiltration of, of uh, you know, hip hop. And, uh, and I, was, I was reflecting, um, you know, my son, you know, who I said to him at, one, at various times, give me some music you know, that I can listen to when I'm working out. And, and what do I get? And I, I, you know, I get hip hop. And, and you know, it's, 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 it's pretty intriguing, the, the notion, you know, of, of infiltration. And I think that's the way, you know, that a lot of new thought, you know, comes to be and comes, you know, into, particularly into the corporate world. Um, you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, it happens. And, and the biggest danger to hip hop, I think, you know, as an example is, is um, you know, that when you start he hearing it on the elevator, you know, then you know, you know, something is wrong. <laughs> you know, but, but the other thought is, is that the, the notion of globalization, and you think about, 
you know, diversity in general, and 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 uh, you know that's another you know form of, of and I call it good in, infiltration. You know that as we're being exposed to to you know different aspects of of, uh, of uh, you know the global economy, uh, we're starting to see new and different things erupting that we don't understand. And, I, and when I say we, you know, you know, we in the corporate world, we we don't uh, completely understand. But our first reaction is to look around. You know what's close to us. You know to see what's different, and we start finding you know different things. You know like you know the the, the Latino you know culture, the the uh, uh, you know the the sexual orientation culture, the hip hop culture, all these things that are around us. You know that we would not have noticed. You know if it weren't for the fact you know that we're now doing business around the world and we're trying to grasp on something that's close. You know nearby. You know that we can begin to understand, which actually expands our thinking. You know beyond our own borders. Any response? Amen. <laughs> I, I think there's another we. I, I just wanted to comment because at McDonald's we have this global uh, initiative called the Voice of McDonald's. And it's a global competition with our crew people. And only our crew people can participate in it. And every other <coughs> year we bring them the winners to Orlando from all over the world. And what's so exciting about that is that we do have these voices from around the globe. And a lot of the voices are hip hop. And at our last um, event two years ago, and it's coming up in April, uh, all the folks that won were from Asia. <laughs> and, like and, and, they yes. so, and they were like so awesome. <laughs> but that voice, that voice, your voice, is all over the globe. And, and they show it to us every time we bring them together. And those voices of McDonald's, they always come up with some terrific hip hop. And it's always so exciting to have all of, even the seniors, on their feet because we <laughs> all enjoy it. And, but it's from around the globe. And, yeah, and right. that's the beauty of it, the voices of McDonald's around the globe. And it's, it's so diverse. And, and we so appreciate that. Ty, did you say the seniors or the seasoned? <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother says, now, baby, don't call me seasoned. I'm seasoned. <laughs> so my question is uh, kind of going back to Adam along the lines of keeping it real. And um, so as you know, many corporations are, are, are challenged with this whole notion of, of authenticity around uh, diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. in particular uh, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Nicole, by the way. <laughs> and, um, specific, and in particular, corporations that uh, don't have that exposure to the, the, to the broad consumer, uh, companies that are business to, to business, I think that challenge around authenticity come, becomes even greater because there isn't that pull from you know, the, the consumer saying, this is what, what I demand. So, I'd just be curious, and this is really for the panel, but if we started with, with Adam's uh, statement around keeping it real, just thoughts around for for us diversity and inclusion practice, practitioners, how you know how do you begin to create those kinds of environments and structures that you spoke to that that allow for the courageous conversations that you spoke to. However, when you're in the face of such inauthenticity, you, you'll get the flip service that you talked about, the but there, especially in, in corporations that don't have that, that pool, you have much more of a challenge to get to that place of keeping it. Well, see, this is, this is the kind of question that's going to take us where we need to go, which is from the theory to the practice. It's challenging stuff. And let me just put a couple of things out there and, and see what sticks. Part of it is about leverage points, and you, you talked about this with the consumer. The consumer often provides a leverage point to enforce authenticity, whether it's in the, the marketing of you know, saying, well, you know, common, and he told me this when he was talking about the, the kind of work that he did with products. Just a quick story. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, he was presented with this opportunity to do a, a commercial with Coca-Cola. And common is a big guy, be healthy, he's vegan, all of that stuff. He doesn't drink Coca-Cola. And his management said to him, well, you cannot miss this opportunity. This will make you go global in a way that you've yet to go. And he said, no, nah, no, I can't do it. It's not me. It's not a kind of organic representation of me. It's not a good match with the product. Uh, 
Well, then they doubled the number, the, the, the amount of money. <laughs> and his mama started talking to him and said, boy, <laughs> you got to think about doing this. And so what he did, and this, was, this is really a testament to Coca-Cola as well. He said, well, you know what? If I do this, I want to do it in my own terms in a way that's authentic and organic to me, which means that I'm not going to be seen swilling a bottle of Coke. I'm going to find something within your brand that also echoes with what I am, with the kind of, kind of uh, real, realness or whatever it may be. And so, so they made a campaign that was around that, that was around him. He never held a, a bottle or a can of Coke, but he uh, kind of created this moment of synergy with the corporation to, to, to get out there and advertise. And, and that's something that the artist demanded. That's something that the audience, by extension, demanded because they wouldn't have bought it if, if he was, if he was right. there you know, sucking right. down a bottle of Coke. And it would have made Coca-Cola look bad. It would have made him look bad. And it wouldn't have been a, a, a fit. So I, I think, to get back to you know, the more business-to-business -business type situations, the, the question is, what, what are the, the leverage points? What are the points at which there can be an argument made that, that uh, Diversity and inclusion will be a good business strategy. Will, will be something that will will extend what the people at the top are already trying to do, you know. And and that may be in a couple of things that we've been talking about, which is is identifying talent that is already there that's maybe being overlooked because they don't talk the same way as as, mm. as others do because they don't look the same way as what the the previous model of success might look like. Mm. Maybe it's that. And I think more important as someone who's on the ground working with, with, as I said, the people who will someday be your employees, is anticipating what uh, your, your, your workplace will look like in the, in the next 10 years, 20 years, and so forth. And the fact that you will have an increasingly diverse uh, workforce uh, with, with much more range of, I mean, just even on the question of Latinos, I mean, the, the Latino population that's, that's entering the workforce now and, and the people who are also not necessarily identifying with the same racial categories. So thinking beyond those categories as well mm -hmm. uh, without disposing of them altogether. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we are not a post-racial nation no matter who is president. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thinking about other ways of, of, of race. So, those may be leverage points. That is the leverage point of a, of a new workforce coming in, the leverage point of, of maximizing the potential of the people who are already in the, the company. And, and, and you know, how do you bring those about? I mean, that's, that's really something I'd li like to build more on. But those are just a couple initial insights. H will be my next to last. Hi, good morning. My name is H, and I work for Pat. So I'll be careful what I say. No. <laughs> H is called it. H, so it's called the Salary Continuation Program. You want to be part of that? <laughs> so much for great, so much for courageous conversation. <laughs> no, no, that's just some levity. Uh, first of all, Adam, Virginia, and Raul, I want to say thank you. Um, I can let you know that as a businessman and as a practitioner of diversity, especially in education, that I'm going to leave here changed, smarter, smarter, and uh, my ability to do my job. Um, Raul, especially around the, this, this idea of the historic um, revelation of Latinos, Hispanics. I think people come into corporate America and they understand that they have a responsibility in terms of profit and loss. I mean, this is no big secret. So, so I look at you and I say, if I'm using your entire diversity package, then I hope you help me attract more people like you, retain more people like you, um, and hopefully sell to more people like you. I think what I'm learning today is that now people want more than that. So there's a deeper conversation about who I am, where I come from, and that might be able to add more value to your brand, and thus increasing brand trust. So. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, again, the, the, the analogy for me is academia. I think, uh, I mean, definitely the sense of the term, I guess, is um, diversity fatigue is what is used in the corporate world. I mean, we don't use that language in the academy, but there's definitely a sense of, yeah, we know about diversity. We know we need to increase it. Yes, we're all for it. But when it comes down to the numbers at hiring faculty or admitting grad students, they're not translating. That's right? where we are, Raul. That's, ex so that's for, exactly. So yeah. for, for me, I think the issue is really of changing the questions, right? The research questions and what we do at research universities, 
right? So that it's not just about bringing in someone who is African American, or the way we would do it is hire someone who does African American lit, but yeah. that could be anybody, right? Not just an African American, but there was always an association there between race and what they studied. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, the question, the more interesting question, is like, well, let's just completely go back to the building blocks in, in my department in English. What is literature? What did other people write? Maybe uh, there's a different history, a print culture history that African Americans have or Latinos have, and they do, that is different than the way you know, um, literature developed for Anglo Americans in the US. So that opens up a whole host of different kinds of research questions that really begin to call into question, what, what is literature? Why, why do we call this writing that? So I, I think maybe in the corporate world, it would go back to those, those questions of, uh, uh, whatever questions you ask, right? The, pre the basic premise is what you're looking for, not just in terms of bodies, but d thinking outside the box of, I mean, my example of literature, right? This memoir, this letter that this person wrote can be read in that way for this specific reason, right? That really expands our sense of what it means to be a human, really, um, and enriches our conversation. So that's my example. So, but still wanting to keep, keep in mind the bodies, right? The, the figures, the fact that we actually do want to translate that into uh, uh, having a, a, a physically, ethnically diverse um, um, academia. And if I can just make a comment that might connect both, it's Nicole, right? Nicole and H's points. Um, I also do um, work with, a, my, my, my next book is um, a book of interviews and conversations with um, a, a black feminist uh, sort of foremother, um, one of the members of the Combahee River Collective who sort of invented, uh, invented um, what's become in academia, at least known as black feminism, her, and her name is um, Barbara Smith. And Barbara's, um, you know, an amazing human being. It's been a really um, huge learning experience for me. And um, one of the, the things that she says a lot is, um, well, diversity and inclusion is all good. You know, I'm glad that you recognize me as a human being. But as a white person, what are you doing to desegregate your life? And the idea here is these are deep structures, right, that we can't get at by having nice conversations um, necessarily. But you actually have to be willing to give things up. Um, and that's why I picked the Amel LaRue song I did, which, uh, um, which is called Giving Something Up. Um, and so, you know, we have to ask these really difficult questions. How many profit points will you shave off to live in a more just world? Right? Because we don't just, we're not just our jobs, right? I'm not just a professor and you're not just a diversity <laughs> officer. We also live in communities and we're parents and we're citizens and we have other interests outside the profit loss statement, right? Um, and that's the, uh, and if you think that's just the corporate world, um, come to my public university sometime and hear us talk. Because we talk about profit loss all the time. We use, we use fancy language around it and we say democracy and we say learning and what we mean is profit loss, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not, we're this, uh, this, these worlds are not so separate. I mean, they're getting close together all the time. Um, but, you know, these, these conversations about privilege, about what are we going to give up in order to live in a world that we can be proud of, that we're morally okay with, um, and that will not implode in the next generation or two, um, are, are, are hard conversations, you know, yeah. and, and they, they mean giving things up as, mm -hmm. as well as enriching, um, you know, culture, enriching um, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I know we have uh, one more comment. Uh, I got something that I want to add to the conversation. <clears throat> Somewhere in the northwest region of Seattle, Washington, there's a homeless man armed with a beer can trying to drink away war memories, waiting for someone selfless enough to lend him an ear. He sits on the side of a pizzeria on the corner of Queen Anne and Mercer in a chair they probably kick him out of after business hours. His skin has grown all too fond of the concrete beds that he rests his shell-shocked head on. His braggadocious body rocks back and forth, showing off to the world the only gifts war veterans ever receive. He addresses me. Hey, little bruh, you got a dollar? Without even checking my pockets, I tell him, I ain't got it. 
Have an anticipated disappointment, he responds with, well, that's fine, because I really wanted a 20. <laughs> Amazed. Not that he still knows what humor is, but that it's one of the few possessions that war actually let him keep. I laugh before digging my hands into my coat pocket filled with a ton of change I'll probably never use. He lets me know that more than a 20, what he really wanted was conversation and takes my 75 cent donation as an invitation to start one. Without offering much room for me to converse, he tells me how in this country, war veterans are rarely anything more than patriotic flies on a wall. And for all these people to ignore his request is just as second nature as swatting at a pest. I guess none of them realize they here lies their tax dollars at work. His body jerks to the percussion of his bones, dancing to the song of post-traumatic stress syndrome. How wrong is it if humans to lack humanity, demanding he keep his lips locked, but possess the audacity to ask where we got his army cap or to think it's a trinket you could purchase at a gift shop. He tells me that they've labeled him as crazy and they say he has to take medicine called Percodine, but the one time he took it and made him high, so why would he continue when it makes his mind worse with time? It seems like the perfect crime, having people fight for a country that won't fight for them. The goal was for one of those countries to take his life from him and the opposing country failed when he returned to civilization, but the home country would succeed by stripping him of his home, how long will this be the standard in this country where if war doesn't kill you, they just steal you, send you back home just to rot and mildew the phrase war was good for absolutely nothing is still true. Before he lets me go, he tells me that he wants to die. And I see a tear-shaped white flag surrender from his eye. He gives me a pound, and I dig back into my coat pocket, surrendering the rest of the change I found. I tell him I have to go, because there's a man screaming at me through traffic, waiting for me to end this conversation. There are two friends at a bar and grill across the street waiting for me to join them for dinner. And there's a poem scratching at the insides of my soul, waiting for me to tell his story. Mm -hmm. uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, was Mr. Lamar Jordan of Louder Than a Bomb and the Chicago uh, Young Authors. So uh, let me thank uh, you again for your wonderful um, participation and observation and comments and, and thoughts during at least the, the, the morning. Another uh, big round of applause for Adam, Virginia, and Raul. Thank you very much.